Um, hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to our open forum, Shaping a UN Cyber Programme of Action. Thank you for joining us despite the early hour, and I'm sure despite some fatigue as we reach the end of our community's gathering. I'm Ellie McDonald from Global Partners Digital. We are a civil society and human rights organization, and we work to ensure a digital environment underpinned by human rights. This session has been co-organized by my own organization alongside Access Now, Global Affairs Canada, and the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We have a brilliant panel of speakers who we're honored to have with us. Um, I'd now like to introduce the panel from left to right. So we have, ooh, or rather, from yeah, left to right, <laughs> we have Dave Heavy, first Secretary of Cyber and Digital Affairs of the Australian Permanent Mission to the UN in Geneva. We have Ambassador Henri Verdier, French Ambassador for Digital Affairs with the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs. We have Joyce Hackme, Deputy Director of the International Security Programme at Chatham House and the co-editor of the Journal of Cyber Policy. And finally, on his way, we have Romanji Singh Chima, Senior International Counsel and Asia Pacific Policy Director of Access Now. Um, and we also would have had David Fairchild, First Secretary of the Permanent Mission of Canada, uh, but sadly, David is no longer able to join us. So the topic of our open forum is the Cyber Programme of Action. The POA is a proposal by a group of UN member states, including from those we'll hear from today. The UN General Assembly has welcomed the proposal as a mechanism to discuss threats in cyberspace, to support states' capacities to implement the responsible state behavior framework, to discuss and further develop where appropriate this framework, and to promote engagement and cooperation with relevant stakeholders. Many stakeholders, including my own organization, have also welcomed the initiative, and provided that it's built on a clear and action-oriented political commitment, focused on implementing the key of responsible state behavior in a human-centric and rights-respecting manner. We see that the POA offers a means to establish a permanent venue for discussions rather than limited term deliberations, to recognize the shared but differentiated responsibilities of different actors by ensuring a mechanism which is open, inclusive, and transparent, and where the contributions of stakeholders are heard and acted upon. Given both the promise of the cyber POA and the peril of not addressing um, the threats which it seeks to combat, we feel there's a need for discussions of the POA to reach a wider audience. To date, the POA proposal has been primarily directed at states and actors active when, within discussions at the UN's open-ended working group on ICTs. And so for that reason, um, we all hoped to hold this open forum uh, to provide an opportunity to receive updates on the POA from those actively involved in discussions about its design, but also for those gathered in this room and online to share their views on the proposal and to ask questions. So we encourage you all to contribute enthusiastically and we have the benefit of being a small group, so please do share your views. Um, so because we'd like to foster an interactive discussion, um, we'd like to begin with a poll for both our participants in person and online. We are going to be using Slido as a platform to facilitate this poll. Some of you might be familiar with this already, but if not, we ask you to please go to the URL currently displayed on the screen, yes, which is slido.com. You'll then be prompted to enter a code which is um, all capitals, cyber-poa, also displayed on the screen. Um, and my colleague, Katie, who is our online moderator, will also share this in the chat. Um, so while you're setting this up, I will briefly explain the structure of our session today. So after talking through briefly the poll, um, I'll ask questions to our first three panelists. We'll then briefly pause for some questions and discussion from those in the room and online. 
This first round of discussion will be focused on getting an overview of the program of action, unpacking what it is, what it hopes to achieve, and why it is needed. After this, we'll move to our um, final question to be followed by questions and discussion. Um, and the second round is focused on ensuring the POA is genuinely multi-stakeholder and founded upon the international human rights law framework. Finally, I'll ask each of the panelists to share a final reflection um, and we'll attempt to share some summary reflections. If you would like to ask a question, please come to the front of the room or the middle of the room to use one of these two microphones. Uh, we have only an hour, so I also ask that our panelists are timely in, the, in their interventions to ensure that the discussion remains interactive. Um, so I'd like to put, turn briefly now to the Slido poll. Um, so if you have it up, you'll see that it asks a series of questions. The first asks for perspectives on the POA. The second uh, asks if you have yet inputted to dialogue on the POA, whether through interaction with a member state, through a regional consultation, through statements or consultations undertaken by the open-ended working group on ICTs, through the UNIDIR consultation, or through a stakeholder effort to consolidate inputs. Our next question then asks for those that have inputted to one of these dialogues on the POA, did you feel that your input was or has been meaningfully considered and reflected in the design of the POA? And if not, what needs to change? So we'll be collecting responses to that to include in our summary report of the session. And um, perhaps I can ask my colleague Katie if we have had any reflections to the first question which asks about perspectives on the POA. predominantly state-based. Okay, so we can return to this again later in our discussion um, and perhaps it gives our panelists something to consider in their remarks. Um, so with that, returning to that later, I'd like to ask our first question, which is to Ambassador Verdier. Ambassador Verdier, uh, France is one of the co-sponsors of the UN Program of Action, a proposal for a permanent, inclusive and action-oriented mechanism. This proposal aims at supporting the implementation of the Responsible State Behaviour Framework and through the UN General Assembly Resolution 7737, it has received wide support. But for those who may be less familiar with the proposal, what precisely is the Cyber POA and what is the objective that it seeks to achieve? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to exchange about those important topics. But we will we'll have to, to enter a bit within the UN machinery and on those topics, machinery matters. So you just have very briefly to understand that the rise of the cyberspace is, could jeopardize all the security architecture because every conflict now has a, a cyber aspect and there is also a real conflictuality within the cyberspace. And this is a, a new situation because uh, a cyber attack is not like a cinetic attack. This is invisible, very fast. Uh, geography doesn't matter anymore. So it doesn't matter anymore. So you have to be sure that the, the framework of global security, like the UN Charter, the Geneva Convention, uh, can be implemented or respected. And this is a long story. In 1998, the UN started to, to work on the, the new, this new context. So 25 years ago, uh, since uh, 2004, uh, there were some group of governmental experts. So it was uh, usually the, the first one was uh, 15 states working during three years to to, commit to, to to write together a final report, and we did analyze the, the new situation. And uh, do you know? Do we uh, first at this time the question was: uh, Does international law apply in the cyberspace? So we it took. 10 years to recognize that international law did apply in the cyberspace. Uh, and then there were a series of um, uh, government, uh, expert governmental groups, GGE. Um, and since uh, 2020, 2021, 
they were, uh, we did extend this conversation uh, through uh, open-ended working groups, so open to every state. So it was more complex to manage, but more inclusive and more um, diverse. So it was a, a good step forward. And more or less since this year, since 2021, France, Egypt, and a group of transregional states is proposing to go further and to, 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 to choose a new vehicle, which is uh, the POA. Why do we propose this? That's because, so as I told you 25 years ago, the question was, uh, do we have to implement international law in the cyberspace? And then we did work hard to understand how to implement international law. And we did all together uh, adopt some norms and uh, norms of state behavior and uh, important principles and uh, some red lines and uh, and that was um, important. I, I can tell you, for example, that when I do observe what's happening in Ukraine and in some conflicts, we understand that some red lines are known and there is little f a form of refrain. Some, some attitude are not there. So we, we can observe that it was important to collectively, together, recognize some, some principles and uh, promise to respect some norms. But that's not enough. And that, uh, our, our view is that it's time to go further. The most obvious aspect is that in the UN system, we are 200, more or less 200 states. And for most of them, to implement those norms is very difficult. If you don't have a a cyber law, a cyber police, a cyber justice, a cert, etc. How can you implement those very complex norms? So capacity building, for example, matters. If we don't organize collectively to be sure that every state will have the ability to, to build a serious resilience, what's the point to discuss norms if you cannot implement them? That's one important aspect. A second one is, of course, the the multi-stakeholder issue. So as I told you, th those processes were born within the first committee. First committee deals with state behavior and state relation. It's about war and peace. So the first committee is not the most uh, multi-stakeholder committee in the UN system, of course. But regarding cyber security, cyber war, cyber peace, uh, first, the cyberspace is not a natural space. It's built by someone, so uh, private sector matters. <laughs> and then, the boundaries between conflict, belligerent, civil society are weaker and weaker. So for a lot of reasons, uh, a strong, a real conversation with uh, civil society and private sector is important. So we want to open a, a more inclusive forum, open to more actors, while respecting state sovereignty, of course. So we have to design something with rooms to exchange all together and while respecting some prerogative and responsibilities of states. So for all those reasons, we consider that it's time to build uh, the next vehicle, and we intend to implement it uh, after the end of the current Open Energy Working Group. And the interest of a program of action, uh, so th this is a format that does exist in the UN system. For example, there is a program of action for small arms and uh, little weapons. First, this is a permanent body, that's very imp important. So first, of course, this is a UN and inclusive body. Everyone can join the project. This is not for few states. This is open to every member states. A permanent body that can have a dedicated team, that's important because if you observe the 25 years process, there were sequences of three and then five years, but every three years you do negotiate a mandate, you build a new team, you adopt a final resolution and then you dismantle everything and you renegotiate a new, a new process. So we need continuity, we need memories, uh, we need dedicated team, we need um, a more action-oriented uh, process because we want to be able, for example, to contribute to finance capacity building. Uh, or why not to publish some indexes, the, the, the POA for small arms and lethal weapon does produce the disarmament index. So they create knowledge and they share resources. They are not just there to adopt a final resolution. And we need a body where you can design a global architecture to have a better co cooperation and conversation uh, with the civil society and private sector. So that's why we are proposing a new format and a new project, 
and we hope that uh, in the next two years we will succeed to, to create this. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Verdier. I think that was very helpful context into the evolution of these discussions. Um, and I'm sure we'll be picking up on your point about the need for a strong and real conversation with a range of stakeholders. Um, so thank you. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn to our next speaker, um, Dave. Australia has been a long-standing advocate of the establishment of the POA as an institutionalized UN mechanism and as the next evolution in UN cyber discussions. Um, but what does a functioning POA look like? And in your view, what are the key ingredients to its success? Thank you, Ellie. Appreciate that uh, for the question. Uh, also, good day to everyone here in the room this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, my response has a lot of overlap and will uh, and reaffirm some of the uh, sentiments shared by Henry here. Uh, and I, even though I am, I really want to reaffirm the importance of that. So, look, Australia is proud to be um, a strong supporter of the initiative to establish a permanent mechanism uh, for responsible state behaviour in the UN. We really are. Um, we really believe that the time is ripe to collectively discuss um, a future permanent mechanism to ensure the endurability uh, of, the, of the UN um, dialogue on responsible state behaviour. As Henry said before, the continuity is really important in that respect. We were heartened by the broad cross-section, uh, cross-regional support for the um, UNGA resolution on the BOA last year. And so we're really, I think with that, we really want to continue and drive forward on the POA and use that momentum. And I suppose we're looking forward to seeing how that pans out next uh, in the coming negotiations in the first committee. Really, I think, we think, Australia thinks, that the POA should build on the hard collaborative work of the open-ended working group in providing practical guidance to implement the UN framework on responsible state behaviour. That's absolutely paramount. The POA is the mechanism to carry forward this commitment. It's really important to rules-based cyberspace. And again, the permanent nature allows us to focus on the, the matters at hand, the substance at hand, rather than renegotiating the processes. But importantly, the POA's focus on capacity building, which is actually something really strong to my heart that I used to work on in Australia, the focus on the capacity building will facilitate all countries, big and small, developing and developed, to determine their own digital future. And I think that's absolutely imperative. It's critical, critical again, that we do not lose that momentum of, doing, of setting up a functioning POA. So what does that involve? I say to you a couple of elements. One, it's scope. It needs a clear mandate that builds upon and reaffirms the agreed framework on responsible behaviour in cyberspace, responsible state behaviour. The second thing I'd say is flexibility. It needs both substantive and procedural flexibility so that the POA can evolve with the global developments. Now really, what does this mean? It means that the framework may be further developed by consensus, but it also has the procedural flexibility in meeting the structures, plenary reviews, and technical meetings that is involved in this whole system. The third element is implement ensuring that the framework can be put into practice. And again, that really highlights my focus and mentioned before on capacity building. And the fourth element, is inclusion, and that's a really, really important thing. Although states remain the main players in the state-based process, discussion should be open to all, to other stakeholders. And we need to empower meaningful participation, participation of voices that aren't normally at the table, as they bring unique perspective. Whether, for example, Indo-Pacific countries and Pacific Island countries that do not have the capacity or the resources to meaningfully and, 
uh, to engage. We want to be able to foster that. I think the other thing is that non-state actors would also help to further refine the POA and to adva advance the solutions under this. So I think that we are confident that if we're serious, if we're all committed collectively to this and incorporating these elements, that the POA and its process will see a strong initiative for fostering peace and stability in cyberspace. Thank you, Ali. And thank you so much, Dave. I think that was really helpful to unpack and understand better what the POA could achieve um, and the different ingredients in your view that are so important to it. Um, just for those who've joined us recently, um, we are also using um, the Slido platform to facilitate interaction during the session. Um, some of you may be familiar with it already. If not, I promise it's very simple to use. You can just visit the URL slido.com um, and then you'll be prompted to enter a code which is cyber-poa. And we've asked a series of questions there on your perspectives on the POA um, and whether you've already inputted to consultations on its contents and if you feel they've been reflected in its design. Um, so the first question on perspectives, I'll just ask our online moderator, Katie, if there have been any further inputs to that question. So actionable, permanent, inclusive, and a crucial roadmap. Those have been the contributions from people, our participants, virtually and in person. Thank you. Um, so at this point, before we turn to our next two brilliant speakers, um, I'd just like to take pause to ask if we have any questions at this stage. Uh, so far, our discussion has focused on understanding what the POA is and what it could hope to achieve. Um, in the next aspect of the discussion, we'll be focusing on um, precisely which aspects of the uh, agenda it could seek to move forward, how it can ensure that it's multi-stakeholder and rights respecting. Um, so perhaps if you have questions, please focus them um, more on the broad scope of the POA. Uh, with that, does anyone have any questions in the room? If you do, please use one of these two microphones. Uh, or Katie, do we have any questions online? Perfect. Okay. Well... I will move to our next question, which is to Joyce Hackney from Chatham House. Uh, Joyce, Chatham House has been an active observer of the UN Open-Ended Working Group on ICTs and is undertaking research on key areas of its mandate, including the application of international law in cyberspace and the further interpretation and application of cyber capacity building principles, among other things, I'm sure. Um, so based on your findings so far and your experience in this process, how could the POA make progress in these areas and contribute to responsible state behaviour in cyberspace? Thank you very much, uh, Ellie, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be uh, with, uh, with my panellists here and to be speaking about this very important topic. I mean, we've heard from the previous speakers about the importance of the POA and the importance of the issue, right? The importance of, you know, international peace and security and responsible behaviour and cyberspace. And uh, we heard also from them about, you know, how it should be ensuring this continuity and have this flexibility. And I guess maybe sort of like my starting point to your, uh, to your question is to focus on the importance of applying the consensus, applying the acquis that you talked about. Um, it's very important to reiterate that states have agreed on the rules of the road, right? This framework that we often refer to, um, not once, but three times, right? First in 2015, and then again in 2021, both in the open-ended working group and in the GGE that the ambassador talked about. So it is very, very important, and not very you know, common that states agree on something, you know, uh, and particularly in cyberspace, and that you know, um, there is a consensus that uh, is reached. So this building on that consensus and operationalizing uh, this framework is extremely important. And the POA, as we have heard, can help with that. As we know, there is a conversation now you know, or like, you know, maybe different visions between implementing what we have agreed upon or, uh, you know, sort of like building new norms or building new illegal instruments. And sort of like my position to that is first, 
you know, these don't have to be mutually exclusive. And second, you know, before we understand what is needed, we have to understand how the current agreement works, right? Does it work well? Does it sort of address the issue that we're trying to solve? Are there gaps, et cetera? And if so, what is the appropriate sort of solutions that we need to develop? So that's quite an important uh, process, I suppose, in order not to develop half-baked uh, uh, solutions. So I guess the sort of the focus of the POA on implementing the framework is a very important one. Now, if we all agree that the implementation is important, then the next question becomes, how do you actually do that? And as we know, uh, you know, the failure to implement uh, the, the framework uh, is, is often not related to willingness, right? Like, it's not like because states don't want to do so. More often than not, it's an issue of capacity, right? There's lack of capacity, there is lack of uh, resources, and there is a lack of a structured and consistent approach. So as we've heard, the POA can help address all of those, right? It can help build the capacity. It can help, uh, you know, create the sustainable and uh, and long-term uh, sort of permanent forum. And also, as we have seen with other POAs, it can help bring resources that will help with operationalization, right? Because it's all good to talk about, oh, yes, we want to do this, we want to do that. But if we don't have the funding, the resources, the human and, and, and otherwise, it's very difficult to actually make progress. Um, now to your specific question on how the POA can contribute to the international law discussions specifically. Um, I guess when I first sort of, um, you know, heard about the POA when it was first put on the table, what I was interested in the most is this sort of like this uh, approach of kind of like having dedicated conversations about the different pillars of, of the framework, you know, on CBMs, on international law, on, on norms. So you're not entangling them with each other and so that, you know, the, the success of one of the Pillar, pillars is not contingent upon the successes of, of others. And I think that's really important because we need to appreciate that, you know, conversations need to proceed somehow at a different pace. They need uh, require different approaches, etc. So the way the POA can function or if it goes in that direction, I think can be helpful to generate uh, meaningful progress. So on the international law, you know, uh, uh, front, there can be uh, dedicated uh, discussions, a de de dedicated work stream that not only talk about international law in broad terms, but also goes specifically, let's say, an international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and address that sort of like those importance, uh, specificities, and nuances in those conversations. Um, and something that uh, the previous speakers uh, focused upon, and of course, you know, like strong advocate being, uh, you know, a, a stakeholder, non-state stakeholder uh, uh, ourselves, there is the importance of bringing the different perspectives into the, into the debate. Uh, of course, you know, the uh, development of international law is the prerogative of, of states, and no one is disputing that, but the experts' perspectives and the experts' input is extremely valuable. In my organization, we have been doing quite a lot of work about the application of international law to cyberspace, um, a lot of like really important findings have come out of that work. So having the opportunity to contribute to the discussions is, is extremely uh, um, valuable. And not only sort of like bringing the perspectives of multi-stakeholders, I think by having those dedicated conversations that aren't necessarily always confrontational, right? It's, we've agreed on that. What does that mean? What do we think it means? It also can help create that opportunity for states to learn from each other, right? And we have seen, you know, at the moment, I think the states who have published their positions on how international law applies to cyberspace, I think they're 30. So like a very small group of the 193 states, and that is expanding. Um, you were the first, yes. Uh, but looking, for instance, at, at, the, at the UK, you know, the country I'm based in, um, the, uh, they, they have been sort of evolution in the way they've been thinking about uh, the international law application to cyberspace to take into more consideration how the threat landscape is, 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 um, is evolving. You know, in the latest one, 2022, there was quite a big focus on ransomware, on the health sector, etc. So having those dedicated discussions in the POA will allow this opportunity to kind of compare notes because as we know, even countries that are allies don't agree on all the principles of international law and how they think they apply. So having those constructive conversations will be uh, very, very important. 
And maybe I'll conclude by one more thing, because you also asked me about the capacity building principles and how they can be operationalized. We're doing at Chatham House a project at the moment, taking the 10 principles that were agreed upon uh, in the OEWG report in 2021, and trying to kind of like unpack them. What do they mean? What is driving them? How can they be implemented in a kind of capacity building uh, context? And we'll be presenting that work in, um, in New York uh, on the sides of the July session of the open-ended working group. So if we where if we had a work stream on capacity building as part of the POA, it'd be great to sort of like be part of that and contribute with our perspectives and the perspectives of other stakeholders on this important issue. Um, thank you so much, Joyce. Um, that was really helpful to understand how the POA itself as the mechanism could be a really valuable venue for progressing discussions on those specific areas. Um, and I found very compelling your remark that um, the different strands could potentially progress at different paces. I know that there have indeed only been around 30 states sharing their views on international law, but um, we've observed at least that some of these discussions have become richer and more detailed at recent sessions um, on international law and its application to cyberspace specifically. Um, so I'm sure we can unpack that more in the discussion. Um, but I'd like to turn now to Raman Jeet Singh Chima from Access Now. Raman, um, given Access Now's work to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk, how, in your view, can the BOA help to ensure cyber stability and peace with a focus on the protection of those most at risk from threats in cyberspace? Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, and I just wanted to give some context for why we participate in the program of action and what our interests are. Access Now is an international digital rights organization, a civil society organization. And we, in a sense, are in an interesting position. We are a cybersecurity or digital security provider. We assist civil society and actors in the wider civil sphere, you could say at risk, when it comes to their reactive and proactive cybersecurity needs. And we also additionally analyze, track, publicly advocate, and campaign on these issues. And our engagement on this uh, in terms of all the cyber processes in the UN and the discussions around the program of action is also recognizing a couple of different facts. The current status of cyber, or you could say operations or state cyber behavior, which is alarming. There's a significant increase in problematic cyber operations between states, but also increasingly targeting civil society, human rights actors, as well as humanitarian actors. And additionally, you are seeing a, a contestation on some of even these agreed norms, which is extremely alarming. But that said, the fact that we have essentially have a new cyber process in the United Nations agreed by such a large number of stakeholders is a significant development. It's a milestone. And it goes to the fact that we do recognize that, again, many actors have said they want regular forms of dialogue that is anchored in the UN, even though people acknowledge that the UN is not the best place for all of these conversations, but perhaps it is one of those you know, regular places, a sort of common space or a court that people go to very regularly on this. And from our perspective, we do think that the fact that this space exists is good, but we should challenge actors. As I've said to Henri or to others as well, I think it's very important that we do have some ambition and we do have some objectives here. Ultimately, we are a human rights organization. For us, the conversation is important. The fact that we're having this civilly, instead of trading either literally cyber warfare or cyber norm warfare by different resolutions or contestation is a good thing, but there are very real world outcomes or very real world threats we need to recognize that should be addressed by these processes. For us, it is definitely even the recognition of the threats that civil society and wider actors face that should be part of the POA process. I think, for example, many of us have acknowledged and been glad that at least the sort of problematic space for cyber, uh, problematic cyber threats that humanitarian actors has at least been discussed in the UN open-ended working group. But the fact that it's been difficult to secure success on that in even naming it in the, in, the review, in the reports of the current OEWG shows that that is a space we can do more. We can talk about how humanitarian actors are under regular concerted cyber attack, how human rights defenders are under different forms of cyber intimidation, including specifically the proliferation of spyware and of the hack for hire and cyber mercenary industry that makes spyware possible. And even a recognition, for example, in that area, that spyware or the activities of this hack for hire cyber mercenary industry 
undermines global cyber security as a whole. And that's, I think, where, for us, for example, a very important area that we could see potential progress. And I was heartened that even in the UN open-ended working group process, the current OEWG, chaired by Ambassador Gafur of Singapore, there was an attempt to name this in the recent draft of the annual uh, periodic report of the OEWG. Unfortunately, it wasn't accepted, which shows the importance of having a cyber process so that we can talk about these issues. But I keep saying, like, we need a little bit of a real-world check. We need to make sure that this OEWG uh, sorry, the POA implements the agreed norms in the OEWG, but also talks about the current external threats and also talks about where we need norm evolution. And that way, in fact, I wanted to like strongly second what Joyce was saying, that it's not a choice between one or the other. It's doing both in one place there. I also just wanted to comment on the real-world politics that drive some of these cyber processes. The fact that, for example, we can go into deeper discussion. I think having a regular uh, fixed place to discuss this is a good thing because I think anyone who follows the OEWG or other processes knows that there is a lot of even fear and uncertainty about having dedicated deep discussions on particular topics because of the sort of shifting nature of the OEWG or even an uncertainty that, okay, if you separate into working groups, does it allow one state or a couple of states to dominate on one issue compared to others? And these are, again, important modality issues to work out there. But I think a regular place that is an existing standing mechanism also provides more comfort to states. That is not something where pe people are going to try to rush through one agenda. There may be many different things. So we can go deep into detail. Because I think when you talk to any of the delegates uh, outside of the you know, main committee rooms in the, even the OEWG right now, Many of them acknowledge, we know we, we know we need to go deeper. We need to go deeper onto current threats. We need to go deeper on concrete things, like, for example, state cooperation on uh, talking about cybersecurity vulnerabilities, vulnerability sharing, joint action, and many other areas, including the always favorite topic of international law. But no one right now is willing, I think beyond a point, to go deep into this in the OEWG structure. So more uh, progress there would be useful. And I did want to name one more area that I think it's interesting even when it comes to implementation. When we've talked about the current OEWG norms, for example, the fact, and the GGA norms, uh, rather, as uh, talked about in the OEWG, even areas of, such as the targeting of CSERTs, the computer security incident response teams and others, is an area that we can talk more about and concretely take action. So at least the current key, you could say, first responders who are trying to protect the internet, trying to advance cybersecurity, are not further put at risk. But that's, in a sense, what my hope is, that we talk about the actors who are immediately right now at risk and who have perhaps not been able to be served or at least better talked about in the OEWG process. We do challenge the more proliferating actors there, and I would put it to all of you that I think there is space to talk about spyware and to talk about the hack for hire industry because if we let it, to, we let it uh, continue to proliferate, and I'm using that term to provoke the diplomats here in the room, uh, that will in fact reduce cybersecurity as a whole. And as I mentioned, we do need to think about who's actually there. I think if you have a regular form of dialogue, many actors will be there beyond the usual suspects as well, particularly from the cybersecurity community, including those outside of, say, the global north, or even like-minded states who do have a critical role to play in this. And that's why I'm very happy that we're having this conversation in this IGF here in Japan. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much, Roman. Um, yeah, very much appreciate um, and second your remarks. And I thank you also for that reality check and also for grounding our conversation in some of the real life impacts of these most systemic threats, including spyware and otherwise. Um, so I hope we can pick up on that in the discussion shortly. Um, but I'd also just like to welcome David Fairchild, First Secretary of the Permanent Mission of Canada, um, and to ask David a question before opening to a more uh, open and interactive dialogue. Uh, so David, Canada has played an active role in promoting multi-stakeholder and human-centric approaches to cyber policy-making processes. Um, what are the challenges in ensuring states and other actors can meaningfully input to the POA? And how can these be overcome to ensure a mechanism which benefits all participants? Thank you. Good morning. And I apologize for being late. Uh, very unprofessional, so excuse me for that. It's just something I could not avoid this morning. So thank you for the question, Ellie, and good morning to everybody and panelists. Um, I won't take a lot of time arriving late, but I think the uh, it's very important a uh, couple of questions. Of course, human-centric approach is an issue we're starting to see more and more in the UN. Um, this relates, I think, largely to 
um, efforts by a number of member states, I think, to further entrench the uh, international human rights frameworks uh, into ongoing UN processes. Uh, this is an effort um, I think Canada obviously supports, um, gender being one primary one that Canada, both from its foreign policies and international assistance policies, pushes um, as a bedrock element of our policies. When it comes to the multi-stakeholderism and, and Canada's efforts, um, I think if you were to go back and look at Canada's submissions and activities over the, the, the previous years, the, whether it be the GGEs or uh, Open and Working Group, uh, we've tried to make um, working with the multi-stakeholder community um, an aspect of our policy development uh, going into these negotiations. And so in, whether it be on some norms development, uh, preparing our open-ended working group policy itself, uh, we've tried to reach out and work uh, before and the months leading up to develop policies uh, together. So a bit of a co-creation. I think we spoke about this in the July session. Um, for us, co-creation is not uh, something scary. I think some member states see sometimes the multi-stakeholder community um, as antagonistic, uh, contrarian, or perhaps pushing um, policies that they can't support. Um, for us, we've focused a lot of our efforts in the Latin American region. Um, I see Pablo's in the room. Uh, we support a number of Women in Cyber Fellows. Uh, we actively support their activities and their work and policy development into these processes. But I think uh, whether it be here or in other UN in, uh, forums, um, I think we found that actually the co-creation um, model actually provides huge benefits. There are views, there are perspectives um, that I think member states either don't necessarily have the bench depth, they don't have um, some of the expertise that uh, exists in the other civil society communities, academia, and I think we found that actually um, opening the doors, uh, sitting down, in fact, framing some of the policies that we wish to pursue, working with certain organizations um, in a trusted environment, has actually allowed us to deepen some of our policy understanding, which improves our ability to negotiate in the room. Um, on the human-centric approach, uh, I won't spend a lot of time because I think that one's probably been covered off. We see uh, this is becoming uh, quite an important aspect, I think, in our negotiating position strategically. Um, the human rights framework is, I would argue, somewhat under uh, attack. Um, I think we wish to ensure that um, as we transition, hopefully, to program of action, but we also see this in other uh, UN processes, uh, that we ensure that the root of much of what we're trying to do is framed within the human rights framework context, which I think is a disputed space, unfortunately. I think I'll stop there for now, Ali. Thank you so much, David. Um, always really appreciate Canada's uh, support for multi-stakeholders um, and advocacy for the value of co-creation in these spaces. Um, so we now have some time for discussion, for questions. Uh, for those in the room, uh, please use these microphones uh, if you'd like to ask a question. Please walk up to them and then I can hand the mic over to you. Uh, for those virtually, please place your questions in the chat. Uh, Kitty, do we have any questions online? Not at the moment. Um, I will also share at the start of the discussion, we uh, shared the details of a Slido with a poll to ask views and perspectives on the POA. Uh, they've been coming in throughout the discussion, so perhaps while we wait for some questions, I can share some of the inputs that have been made. Um, so in terms of reflect, sharing perspectives on the POA, uh, participants have commented that the POA should be a shared responsibilities of different actors, that it should be actionable and permanent. Some have also commented that it's undefined. Um, others have noted the value of it being inclusive. And speaking to the point of inclusivity, others have noted that it's predominantly state-based. We then asked um, if participants have inputted to dialogue on the POA. Um, some have, by, through member states, through engagement at the open-ended working group and through civil society consultation. And when we asked if they felt their views had been incorporated, um, 
there was a spectrum of opinion on that point. <laughs> so unless we have any questions online or in person, not yet, um, I'll just pose a question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead when you get to the mic. Right. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Jennifer Bramlett. I work with the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate with the Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee. Um, we talked about the, the threat landscape and, and of course, um, what we're looking at from the counterterrorism point of view is basically how violent extremists and terrorists can misuse uh, cyber capacities to conduct terrorist attacks. Um, we're focused very much on content, very much on um, purchase of weapons, use of the dark web, use of drones, use, you know, financing of terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, through cyber means, largely because we can't really talk about cybersecurity. Uh, the mandate for cybersecurity in the Security Council is limited to the protection of critical infrastructure from terrorist attacks. We're even somewhat limited to talking about the types of cyber attacks that terrorists could conduct against critical infrastructure. Um, there, we have kind of a, a no-go zone, particularly when it comes to anything that could smack of state-sponsored cyber warfare. We can't even approach it, so we have a very, very, very narrow window on cybersecurity in the Security Council. And what this means is that CTED and the UN Office on Counterterrorism are very limited in the types of technical assistance and capacity building that we can do. So UNOCT, and you know, it's not normal for CTED to promote CT, uh, OCT, but here we are. Um, they've put out some very good knowledge products. Um, they're available on OCT's website. It's through the um, OCT program on cyber and uh, emerging technologies. And again, they've put out a, a practical guide for first responders um, to an event of what to look for in terms of e-evidence, how to process it, et cetera. Uh, there are a number of other really interesting guidelines, but the, the focus of the work is largely on open source intelligence, um, training uh, law enforcement officers and security officers how to comb through and look for content um, because of this limitation. And so where I'm going with this is really to see, like, to, and to encourage uh, the work of OEWG, the work of um, the other bodies in the UN on the General Assembly side of the House, um, to start to bring this language into the um, counterterrorism strategy and, and to bring it in through um, negotiations with member states into the Security Council area so that we can work on it more effectively. Um, with regards to human rights, uh, just to point out that OHCHR and the Special Rapporteur for Human Rights and Counterterrorism um, have very emphatically stated that international law frameworks, including international human rights law, applies equally online as as offline. And that's a language that, you know, from, from my perspective, um, I'd like to see that repeated more often and brought m into UN architectures and reports uh, to emphasize that because, again, that helps me to be able to talk more specifically about human rights and not having to um, debate that, um, that, that human rights, yes, apply equally online as offline. And then, um, finally, CTED's in the process of finalizing the drafting for the non-binding guiding principles for member states on ICT and preventing and countering their exploitation for terrorist purposes. And, uh, you know, it, granted, um, it will be a negotiated document, but I do invite you to, to reach out to me or to my office um, if there is language that you want to see. We've, I did 14 rounds of negotiations and consultations uh, with civil society, academia, with UN partners, IROs, et cetera, but there's still room for language to come in, and if there's language that's being developed uh, for the POA that could be rolled into these non-binding guiding principles for member states because implementation of regulations and everything else is going to be very important, kind of the downstream piece, then, then please do. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that very helpful contribution. Um, I, I don't. I think there was some really helpful remarks there. Um, I wonder if anyone wants to react to them. Um, yeah, Henri. So you you did have a, a small view on the, the vast diversity of topics, actors, and uh, that's very interesting. And thank you for the opportunity. I would like to put the emphasis of one very important aspect. We did all mention implementation, action-oriented, etc. But the big question is, can we build peace, stability, and security 
just with norms, just with promises of good uh, behavior. And my view, our view, is that that's not enough. Norms, law, matters, of course, a lot. But we are speaking about the cyberspace. I, I was thinking, long time before Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings, <laughs> Plato, do you remember, wrote about the ring of judges. Do you remember this text? And the question was, if I can be invisible, will I remain ethical? And Plato said, no, <laughs> if I'm invisible. And the question is, in the cyberspace, can we build uh, more resilience? And to build resilience, we, 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 we need to go a bit further than norms and text. We need to help everyone to have, to have good infrastructures. We need to help everyone to have good organization, to, to build capacities. And I'm very serious, uh, if we, because as I said, the next step for in the cyber warfare or, st or terrorist attack or hybrid threat is that everyone will attack someone through another country and will remain invisible, not eternally, but during a few weeks, which is enough to destabilize or to, to change uh, the course of uh, a conflict. So the question is, the, 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 the real reason where we did propose to go further than DGEs and Open Energy Working Group is that we consider that if we want peace, stability, security, you need to, to introduce within the, not just the conversation, but the work, the design of infrastructures, capacity building, etc. And that's very important because that's a bit new in the first committee. We have to think not just in terms of international law, but also in terms of building security, which is a, a step further. And I want to emphasize this because this is a, the reason why it was so long, because we did change the, the framework of the conversation, and what we, but also why there is some interest on this, and uh, we really need to go in this direction. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Verdier. Uh, Roman, I think, wish to respond. I might ask you just to be brief so that we also have time for some final remarks. Thank you. I, Jennifer, want to thank you for the question. I think it's an excellent one, and a comment also about all these different issues and equities at play in cyber conversation in the UN. And I think that's one important part of as we built out the POS still, right? I think you've hit that very importantly. There are going to be many other cyber conversations, some that will take uh, direction or uh, steer from the POA, but others that may continue independently. My suspicion is that the counterterrorism debate is one that is still fairly complicated, particularly because of the sensitive nature or the contested nature of discussions around non-state actors in the existing OEWG process and elsewhere, that there may still be some lack of clarity for a while. And in a sense, many actors would have to depend on the Delhi Declaration and what came out of the Counterterrorism Committee and Security Council. But I think, again, naming that right, that the role of the POA with regards to the Security Council overall is going to be that sort of tricky area that we need to think about it further. I did want to like strongly like second what you know, Hen on, you know Henri said, it's not just about no, no it's about thinking through security and how we implement it. I think there, that is why I'm also interested very specifically on how human rights and human rights defenders come into the conversation because the conversation in the OEWG is being challenging for humanitarian actors and international humanitarian law. I suspect there's still a lot of resistance to talking about targeting of HRDs. And if one were to talk about HRDs, counterterrorism, and cyber as well, it's even more contested. So I think we should go there. That's exactly where we should land in a few years. I suspect in the initial period, everyone's going to shy away from it. Um, just a brief reaction from Joyce before our final remarks. Thank you very briefly. I think you raise a very important point and building on what Raman said. It, I mean, uh, you know, how, how can, and it's important actually that it's coming from someone within the UN system. I mean, we struggle with the fact that the UN cyber processes do not connect with each other, right? And you're raising a larger point, how can they connect with other issues? And, and Raman talked about the sensitivities. And I think to me, this is really where the multi-stakeholders can play a very important role, right? Kind of in understanding where they connect understanding where the linkages are, where the overlaps are, and bringing them to the table, and hopefully the POA can be a vehicle for doing that. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, I'd now like to turn to speakers just for their final remarks. Um, I ask that you maybe take no more than 30 seconds a minute, um, if possible. But in those final remarks, I would be keen particularly to hear your views 
um, on the next steps and specifically how the wider community and stakeholders can be, become more involved in these discussions. Um, so I'd like to turn first to Ambassador Verdier, if you're ready, or else to another speaker. Yes, but I've made my final remark. I think security in a world where you can be invisible. Thank you. And Dave? Thank you. I really want to pick up on three things uh, that was mentioned before. Actionable, permanent, and inclusive. Absolutely hear you. Australia does. I think that's why Australia is advocating the participation of all uh, member states, all countries, and non-state actors. That was in our messaging, and we really want to emphasise that. Permanent? Absolutely. Again, that's why we highlighted that the, we see the POA as a means to do that. The POA in itself does that. And actionable, that's why, again, we absolutely support the emphasis and focus on the capacity building there too. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Joyce? Thanks, Ali. I think uh, you know it's 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 heartening to hear about how multi-stakeholderism and the inclusion aspect is is being pushed for by the uh, some of the kind of like uh, pioneers of this initiative, and we look forward to hopefully seeing this initiative as one you know. Um, a sort of like moving the conversation beyond just should the multi-stakeholders be in the room to actually how do we work better together. Thank you, Joyce. Roman, may I turn to you? Participation is crucial. I think, in fact, there I am worried that the POA is still one more cyber process anchored in UN headquarter locations and not internationally. And just actionable things. Many of the governments and actors here are there consultations on the POA process in your capitals or where you are? That's maybe an immediate next step. But I'll leave this with you. Participation is crucial. Frankness and ambition is as, if not even more important. OK, well, last word to me. Uh, yeah, just thanks very much. And I think uh, much of what I was said is already covered off here. It's about equity and agency. Uh, I've said this for a long time. I mean, cyberspace is a co-owned space. I think member states have to recognize that. Uh, the POA is an aggregator. There are lots of strands of works. It will only increase as we look at the de bridging the digital divide and accelerating connectivity. Cyber resilience, which was mentioned, I think is the development, is a developmental issue closely linked to cybersecurity, and that is only going to expand as we try to bring on the last 2.6. For Canada, uh, involvement, the POA for us is just simply the way to institutionalize that dialogue and provide a platform to bring people together to work through the issues and look at ways to bridge the gap. So from a capacity building perspective, thank you. And thank you so much to all the speakers for those important reflections. I hope we can capture them in the report. Um, and then just to conclude with some very short summary reflections, I think we've heard that the POA would be only the next step in a long history and evolution of discussions on cyber at the UN that it must implement the framework, but that it must also allow for evolving discussions, but indeed that it's also more than the framework. It must allow for capacity building and oper operationalization um, of discussions within it, but also that it must walk the talk and respond to real life events and to threats, um, that a diversity of views must inform it, and indeed that as a mechanism, it must be co-created and co-owned. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your time, for your participation in the poll, um, and wish you a happy rest of your time at the IGF. Thank you. <laughs>